The Western Front, January 1917. The hopes of men lay frozen in the grip of winter, one of the coldest in living memory. A British war correspondent wrote, The snow gave a beauty even to no man's land, lying very softly over the tumbled ground of minefields, so that all the ugliness and destruction and death was hidden under this canopy. The snowflakes fluttered upon stark bodies there and shrouded them tenderly. It was as though all the doves of peace were flying down to fold their wings above the obscene things of war. Cold imposed a defiant cheerfulness. Keeping warm became a major preoccupation. We used to have to sleep in our clothes and our boots. We used to place our top boots under our bodies because they used to be stiff in the morning. One couldn't get them on. Uh, the weather then was very, very bitter. The ground was frozen hard. The hoofs of a horse or the tread of a man's boot would linger for quite a month and when we received our rations the bread had to be sawn through because the ice we could see the ice in it the sinews of war were paralyzed by the cold boilers of railway engines froze solid ships were trapped in sheets of ice vehicles slithered to a halt aircraft were grounded The guns still fired, though accurate artillery observation was often impossible. There was, wrote an onlooker, something suggestive of tragic drama in this silent countryside where millions of men were waiting to kill each other. By the beginning of 1917, some 1,300,000 Frenchmen had been killed or were dead of wounds or in prison or missing. A loss of nearly one life for every minute of the war. The French army had forgotten how to smile. An old soldier summed up the French state of mind. They had lost the habit of the sun. They even feared the moonlight. They had abandoned the red trousers and capi of 1914 along with their illusions and had put on horizon blue. The blue of a horizon always dirty, dulled and without hope. Now the French soldiers were being asked for yet one more effort. They responded once again to a promise which brought fresh hope. General Robert Nivelle, the man who had replaced Joffre, assured his army the rupture of the front is possible in 24 to 48 hours on condition it is made with a single stroke and by a sudden attack Nivelle was aiming at nothing less than an outright victory as an army commander at Verdun his tactics had been brilliantly successful on a small scale but this attack involved a million men it envisaged in Nivelle's words the destruction of the principal mass of the enemy armies in the Western theater by a decisive battle delivered with a considerable numerical superiority against the whole of the enemy's available forces, breaking through the enemy's front in such a way that the breakthrough can be immediately exploited. The plan was, in fact, a return to the French offensive doctrines of 1914. It was a plan with the simplicity of genius or lunacy. General Nivelle was cultivated, plausible, intensely ambitious. He expressed himself ably. But British military leaders, familiar now with the hazards of the Western Front, remained skeptical of his plan. General Robertson, chief of the Imperial General Staff, voiced their fears. To Haig and myself, the plan seemed to have in it many fallacies. A breach in the enemy defences on the scale contemplated couldn't possibly be effected within 48 hours. 
Major Spears, a liaison officer who understood the French army, had other misgivings. The French army had suffered and fought too long. It was tired to death. The light that had guided them receded as they advanced farther down the long, hopeless road of the war. Verdun, Champagne, Ypres, Artois, the Somme, the Scarpe, they were all just synonymous for suffering and death. Behind the lines, too, the war had left deep scars. The heart of France was beating slower now from loss of blood, from the agony of cumulative grief endured by so many parents, so many wives, so many hundreds of thousands of orphans. The assembling French armies, new weapons and new tactics now offered new hope. The men were exhorted, Keep moving. The infantry must be through the rearmost German position seven hours after zero hour. And Nivelle insisted that the stamp of violence, of brutality, and of rapidity must characterize your offensive. Gradually, the familiar round of preparations gathered momentum. As division after division, over a million men, moved into the assembly areas, the spark of the mound was rekindled. The Marseillaise was heard again on the march, as it had been in 1914. From French West Africa had come 35 battalions of Senegalese, men of fierce courage but quite unused to the cold of a northern winter. From the distant Urals and from Moscow had come two brigades of Russian troops. They had landed in Marseille the year before. They received an ecstatic welcome. Now, in France, in March 1917, they read in their newspapers of a revolution in Russia. The Tsar had abdicated. There was talk of peace. The Russian troops in France were a source of disaffection. They were divided among themselves. When they went on leave to Paris, they became a prey to Russian revolutionary propaganda. They went so far as to take a vote on whether to join in the offensive at all. They decided, by a majority, to fight. It was not a good omen. The Germans, too, had had a hard winter. They occupied haphazard trench lines into which they had been cast by the ebbing tide of the Somme battles. Hindenburg told the German Chancellor, The military position can scarcely be worse than it is. Hindenburg's lieutenant, Ludendorff, predicted gloomily that if one of the Allies did not collapse, the defeat of Germany was inevitable. The probability of the Allies breaking through in the West had worried Ludendorff ever since the Somme. All through the winter, he had been building an immensely strong system of fortifications in depth, running from Arras in the north to Soissons in the south. The Hindenburg Line, as the Allies called it, overlapped the sector which Nivelle was proposing to attack. It was not yet finished in February 1917, but under pressure from local British attacks in the north of the salient, and with expectation of the French offensive, Ludendorff ordered a withdrawal to the new line, in some places 30 miles behind the original front. The decision to retreat was not reached without a painful struggle. It implied a confession of weakness that was bound to raise the morale of the enemy and lower our own. One night we were 